Welcome to the second episode of Chapter 2. In the previous episode, we discussed some research from Dr. Willow B. Britton on the challenging or distressing experiences that meditators can have while on their path toward realizing their higher selves. In particular, we saw that many are confronted with traumatic memories from their past, memories which are often accompanied by somatic energy or energetic sensations in the body. We're going to begin today by hearing the story of Dan Lawton, whose experience parallels in many ways that of David from the last episode. Then we're going to dive back into Britain's research and see what, if anything, a challenging meditation experience might share with psychosis. In his Substack post titled, When Buddhism Goes Bad, meditation teacher Dan Lawton describes how he had just begun a two-week retreat and was getting ready to go to bed when he suddenly sensed a tightening inside of him. The pressure intensified and popped. A spike of fear slashed through his guts, and that's when he split apart. If you watched the last episode, you'll no doubt recognize this as the somatic energy that many in Britain's study experienced. Lawton continues, The next four hours were a hellscape of terror, panic, and paranoia. There were almost no thoughts, only my body begging to escape my skin, convulsing like a fish fighting for life. The fear was a bottomless trench. I knew nothing except that something, everything, was terribly wrong. For minutes, I was completely immobilized. And even when I regained control, I was incapable of finding help. I wasn't sure if I was real, or if the door to my cabin was real, or if anyone outside of it would be real. Lawton ends up leaving the retreat soon thereafter, and is eventually diagnosed with symptoms of PTSD. He writes... I had never previously experienced a psychotic episode and have no history of mental illness besides occasional bouts of mild anxiety and depression. And I didn't have a history of any major trauma prior to the retreat. In that way, Lawton is similar to a majority of participants in Britain's study, as only one third of them had any psychiatric history and less than half reported the trauma history. And with regard to psychiatric history, the researchers note that if an alternative cause such as medical illness or pre-existing psychological conditions could have wholly accounted for the experiences reported, then these subjects failed to meet causality criteria and were excluded from the study. So what could be going on here? How could meditation have caused what Lawton describes as a psychotic episode? And is it related to David's experience of psychological hell, where an intrusive thought commanded him over and over to kill himself? I don't know. What we do know is that according to the data from Britain's study, the sheer terror that both men experienced was incredibly common, with 82% of participants reporting fear, anxiety, panic, or paranoia. Why is this happening? Isn't meditation supposed to reduce anxiety? Well, if you accept the premise that meditation tunes one into the psychic realm, much like psychosis and psychedelics, it actually makes a lot of sense. Think of the cold stab of panic that can appear during a psychedelic journey or the paranoia that frequently accompanies cannabis use. By the way, cannabis is not a psychedelic, but it is an entheogen, and thus also tunes one into the psychic realm. But we'll talk more about that when we get to the chapter on psychoactive chemicals, as the relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia is a big one. Anyway, back to Britain's study. Beyond the 82% of participants reporting fear, anxiety, panic, or paranoia, was there anything else worth noting? Why, yes! 10 points for Gryffindor. Just under half of participants reported delusional, irrational, or paranormal beliefs. Now, Britton and her team note that they had difficulty coding this category, as a particular belief could be appraised in multiple ways, depending on the practitioner and his or her social context. This echoes what we saw in episode two, where what constitutes a delusion in one culture is considered par for the course in another. But delusions are a big topic, and we won't really get into them until chapter four. In the meantime, isn't it interesting how so many of these participants began to have paranormal beliefs while meditating? To be clear, nowhere in the paper do Britain or her team make the claim that any of these participants were psychotic, though this is in large part due to the fact that neither mania nor psychosis were phenomenological categories in our coding structure, even if practitioners or more commonly experts use such terms to describe an experience. Also, this couldn't be psychosis because they're only reporting delusions. It's not like they're hallucinating or anything. 42% of participants reported hallucinations, visions, or illusions. What? 
What is going on here? Why are so many of these people meditating having delusions and hallucinations? How is this not psychosis? What terrific questions! As you know, my view is that we stream consciousness. So think of these meditators as tuning into different channels or, or accessing data on frequencies beyond normal default consciousness. That's kind of the whole point of meditation, at least as I understand it, to get ourselves out of that egocentric mindset that we're always in, to change the channel that we're always watching. And when one starts to tune into these higher frequencies, one is going to encounter all kinds of funky stuff, such as paranormal phenomena, because that's the medium through which they operate. They exist on these other channels, these other frequencies of consciousness. Now, I realize for some folks that might have just gone in one ear and right out the other, and that's totally fine, okay? We're going to keep chipping away at this. Until then, we have more tangible issues with which to concern ourselves. For example, I'm here talking about all these delusions and hallucinations when a majority, albeit a slight majority, of the participants in Britain's study reported nothing of the sort. And given that we've been focusing so much on psychosis in previous episodes, one could make the argument that all of this data actually don't support my case at all. Naturally, I don't agree, because 45% is still pretty high. But I'm so glad that you pointed this out. Well, actually, I pointed it out, but who cares? Because it's going to allow us to get into some of the nuance of this conversation. But to do so requires that we dip our toes back into the funky stuff. Think of the psychic realm and consciousness more generally as existing on a spectrum. Imagine it like a rainbow, where default or normal consciousness is red, and then way deep into the psychic realm is purple. And with the right technique, one can tune into frequencies anywhere in between. We spend most of our time in red, but even when we're flirting with orange, let's say you're experiencing a runner's high or just narrowly avoided a car accident, most of reality still resembles that of red, only it's a little bit sharper, a little bit, a little bit clearer. But as your brain begins to tune further away from red, let's say we're getting into yellow and green now, it can get scary because it's not as familiar as red. Which even when, even when life sucks, red is still our happy place. It's what we know. It's where we feel safe. The 82% of participants who reported fear, anxiety, panic, and paranoia did so because they were leaving red. They were leaving their safe space. I'll stop there as I know that was a lot. But the key takeaway here is that the psychic realm exists on a spectrum. And its shallow waters can pose challenges far short of psychosis, such as anxiety and panic. If you wade in a bit deeper, you might experience depersonalization, which is common among people who seek Britain's help. Wade in too deep and you risk drowning, and that's where schizophrenia comes in. That's all for today. I want to end by stressing that meditation in and of itself isn't bad for you. It has tremendous potential to change an individual for the better. At the same time, it comes with risks. We also see this dynamic with psychedelics, which isn't surprising because both can tune a person into the psychic realm. Also, I know we got a bit in the clouds with this one, but fear not, because next episode, we're going to be returning to Earth, where we'll be discussing some of the reactions to Britain's research, and also getting at why the adverse effects of meditation aren't more widely discussed. On that note, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Joseph Campbell that really gets to a lot of what we talked about today. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of that. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.